If you're a cloud engineer right now, or you've got a few cloud certifications and you want to break into this field, then you are probably hearing a lot of noise about AI. Seemingly every day, there's a new AI breakthrough. Every job listing mentions AI. AI layoffs are happening almost every day. And to be honest, I get it. It can feel overwhelming maybe even a little bit threatening. But here is the thing. Right now, cloud engineers are actually uniquely positioned to take advantage of what's happening with AI. I'm Suleiman. I spent over a decade of working in tech. Today, I run my own consultancy. And through my academy, I've helped over 700 students transition to cloud engineering. Now, I've seen this industry from virtually every angle. And right now, there's a massive gap in the market. There are plenty of AI or machine learning engineers who can build these AI models. But when it comes to actually getting those AI models running in the real world, world efficiently and at scale, well, that's where everything starts to fall apart. An AI model or prototype sitting in a test environment is as good as useless. It only becomes valuable when it's deployed, when it's running reliably, when it's accessible to users, when it's secure. And that is infrastructure. That is cloud engineering. So if you want to set yourself apart in the job market, you have to understand AI. And in this video, I'm going to walk you through the five AI skills that every single cloud engineer needs in 2026 and beyond. Number one is understanding AI workload patterns. Before you can make smart decisions about infrastructure for AI, you actually need to understand how AI workloads actually behave. And the first thing that you need to understand is the difference between training and inference. Training is the learning phase. This is where you feed the system massive amounts of data and it gradually learns to recognize patterns. You've probably heard of the figures that it costs to train ChatGPT around $100 million. And to do this training, it takes a huge amount of computing power. We are talking hours or even days of processing, but it doesn't need to be instant like a website loading for a customer, for example. If your training takes a few extra minutes, then nobody's sitting there waiting. Inference is when the model is actually being used. Used. Someone types a question into a chatbot, a photo gets uploaded, a customer gets a product recommendation. This needs to be fast because users are waiting. So training is slow, heavy, and it can be scheduled. But inference needs to be quick and responsive. The second concept is batch processing versus real time. Batch is when you're handling lots of requests on a schedule, maybe processing yesterday's transactions overnight for fraud detection. Real time is when someone's waiting right now for an answer. Now, why does this matter? Well, because each of these patterns have completely different infrastructure requirements, different compute needs, different scaling strategies, different cost profiles. And once you understand what kind of workload that you're actually dealing with, you can start making smarter decisions about everything else. And that naturally leads to the question of compute. Because once you know what type of workload that you're running, you need to figure out what hardware should be actually running on it, which is number two choosing the right compute for AI workloads. This is where a lot of people get it wrong. And there's this assumption that anything with AI just means GPUs. That if you're doing anything with artificial intelligence, you need the most expensive GPUs available, but that's not always true. And understanding when it's not true is where engineers add real value. You see, GPUs were originally designed for rendering video games. They're good at doing thousands of calculations simultaneously, which is why they've become so popular for AI workloads. But modern server CPUs have a evolved massively and can now handle a lot of AI works efficiently at a fraction of the cost, which is why I'd like to introduce to you the AMD Epic 9005 series, the sponsor of today's video. This is their fifth generation architecture builds on a three to four nanometer process. For me and you, that means more efficient power usage and better performance. These chips come in two variants. You've got Zen 5 with up to 128 cores and Zen 5C with up to 192 cores. To give you some perspective, your laptop probably has somewhere between four and 16 cores. So we're talking about a completely different scale of processing power. That kind of core count gives you massive performance, which is exactly what you need for data pre-processing in AI pipelines. They all spot up to six terabytes of DDR5 6400 memory. This is critical for memory intensive AI workloads. The more memory that you have, the bigger the data set that you can work with efficiently without constantly needing to move data in and out of storage. And the DDR5 6400 is fast memory, which means less time waiting for data to be available. On top of that, you're also getting double digit IPC improvements over the previous generation. IPC stands for instructions per cycle. Basically, how much work the processor can do in each clock cycle. Double digit improvements means significantly more performance even at the same clock speeds. So why does any of this matter for you as a cloud engineer or someone trying to break into cloud or even work with cloud technology? First is server consolidation. One modern Epic server can replace multiple legacy machines, which frees up physical space in a data center. It frees up the power budget, and that means there's more room 
room and more power available for GPU racks where you actually need it. Second is cost efficiency. Not everything needs to be a £30,000 GPU. A lot of inference workloads, especially with smaller models, run perfectly well on modern CPUs. Product recommendations, tech classifications, chatbots of reasonable size models. CPU instances can handle these really well and cost significantly less. Understanding when an epic powered instance handles the job saves your company lots of money. And it also helps you stand out among your peers. Third is the host processor angle, and this is something people often overlook. Even in GPU heavy setups, the CPU still matters. It handles all the data preparation and post processing. So if you've got a weak host processor, it then creates bottlenecks where your expensive GPU sits idly waiting for data to be ready. So you're paying for that GPU time, whether it's working or not. On AWS specifically, look at the M7A instances. These are powered by AMD Epic processors. Understanding when to choose M7A versus jumping straight into GPU instances like P4D or P5 is generally a valuable skill. If your workload is primarily about processing large volumes of data, data transformation, feature engineering, or running inference on smaller models, M7A instances are going to give you excellent performance at a much lower cost. Now, if you're doing heavy model training or running inference on very large models that specifically require GPU acceleration, that's when you reach for GPU instances. So it's not really about avoiding GPUs altogether. It's about knowing when you actually need them and when you're just burning money. Now, if you'd like to further dig into the specs and use cases of the AMD's Epic Resource Hub, I'll just leave a link in the description below. And thank you so much for AMD for sponsoring this video. So once you figured out the compute side, the next challenge is actually getting these models deployed and running reliably in production. So number three, MLOps and model deployment. Now this is the skill that will quickly make you indispensable. MLOps stands for machine learning operations. Now, if you're already familiar with DevOps, which is the practice of automating how software gets built, tested and deployed, then MLOps is essentially the same thing, but specifically for machine learning models. Now, as we mentioned, prototypes in testing environments are as good as useless. And getting these models and prototypes into production where real users can actually access them is a completely different challenge. So here is the 80-20 of what you need to understand. First is containerization. A container packages everything a model needs to run. The code Code, the dependencies, the configuration. Everything bundled together so it works the same way wherever that you deploy it. Docker is the main tool that you'll use for this, but you can also use ECS, which is Amazon's managed service for containers. Machine learning containers typically have some specific challenges that you need to get familiar with. They tend to be larger than a typical application container and need more special configurations for GPU access. Secondly is model serving. Once you've containerized your model, you need something to actually serve it. And this just means that it takes incoming requirements Request, it runs them through the model and returns the results. So input, transformation, and output. There are tools specifically built for this, like TensorFlow Serving. Now, understanding how to configure and optimize these is super valuable. Thirdly, is versioning and rollback. Models get updated constantly. New versions get trained on fresh data. You need the ability to roll out new versions gradually. Maybe testing a small percentage of traffic before going fully live. And you need the ability to roll back quickly when something goes wrong, because something will go wrong eventually. Fourth is monitoring. This goes goes beyond normal infrastructure monitoring. With machine learning systems, you need to watch for something called model drift. This is when a model's predictions start getting worse over time because the real world has changed since the model was originally trained on that data. Tracking prediction quality and input data patterns gives you early warning signs before problems become serious. Now, AWS does have managed services like SageMaker that do the heavy lifting here with AI models and the things that we've just mentioned, but you still need to understand what they mean and how they can be leveraged. Now, once you've got your models running in production, the next thing leadership is going to ask you is cost. Number four, cost optimization for AI workloads. AI workloads are not cheap right? We're talking about some of the most expensive computing that you can run in the cloud. The initial excitement around AI is starting to give way to some harder questions. Companies are looking at their cloud bills, and I say cloud because remember, AI runs in the cloud, and yet eyebrows are being raised and questions are being asked on exactly what companies are paying for. And this is where cloud engineers who understand cost optimization can become incredibly valuable. Here is what you need to know. Firstly is spot instances. Cloud providers have spare computing capacity that they sell at massive discounts, sometimes up to 90% off than a normal price but it comes with a catch. The catch is that they can reclaim that capacity with short notice if demand increases. For training workloads, this is often completely fine because you can save your progress at regular intervals, something called checkpointing, and then pick it up where you left it off if you get interrupted. Knowing how to architect training pipelines that handle interruptions gracefully can actually save your company a fortune. Second is right sizing. This basically means not paying for more than you need. Most AI workloads are over-provisioned. 
people just spin up the biggest instances available because they're not actually sure what they really require. Being able to analyze real usage patterns and recommend appropriate sizing is straightforward work because it saves real money. Thirdly is scheduling. Training workloads don't always need to run during peak hours. If you can shift them to nights or weekends when overall demand is lower and prices are cheaper, you reduce your costs significantly. This is about thinking strategically about when work happens and not just how. Fourth is understanding the full cost picture. The compute itself is just one part of what you're paying for. There's also data transfer, storage, logging, monitoring. Sometimes the biggest savings come from optimizing something that you weren't even looking at initially. Now, there's one more skill area that often gets overlooked, but it's becoming more critical day by day. Number five, AI security and compliance. When you consider that the average data breach costs just under $5 million, security and compliance can no longer be overlooked. And with AI especially, I think regulation will start to catch up with the technology. Where we are right now is all guns blazing and regulators are pretty much standing on the sidelines and just watching things unfold. And AI systems introduce security and compliance considerations that traditional infrastructure simply doesn't have. And as a cloud engineer, if you really wanna stand out in the job market, you need to understand what these are. Firstly is model security. AI models can be attacked in ways that might not be obvious at first. Adversarial attacks, attacks that involve feeding carefully crafted inputs that trick the model into producing the wrong outputs. Model extraction attacks try to essentially steal the model by analyzing your responses over time and reverse engineering how it works. Understanding these threat vectors helps you build more secure systems from the start. Second is data privacy. Models are trained on data and that data often contains sensitive information. So you really need to think carefully about how training data is stored, who has access to it, whether the model might accidentally memorize and later reveal some private information to customers. Now, these are the real risks that need to be addressed at the infrastructure level. Thirdly is regulatory compliance. New regulations are coming into force around the world. The EU AI Act is a major one. These regulations have specific requirements about transparency, documentation, and how AI systems can be used. So understanding what's required and being able to demonstrate compliance is becoming an essential skill. Fourth is governance. Who's allowed to deploy the models? Who can access predictions? If something goes wrong, can you trace back to understand which version of which model made which decision? These questions need infrastructure answers, access controls, audit logging, version tracking. This is exactly the kind of work cloud engineers are already equipped to handle. So those are the five AI skills every cloud engineer needs heading into 2026 and beyond. Understanding AI workload patterns so you know what you're actually dealing with, choosing the right compute so you're not wasting money on the hardware that you don't need, MLOps and model deployment so you can get models into production and keep them running, cost optimization so you can make AI economically viable, and security with compliance so you can do all of this responsibly. All you're doing here as a cloud engineer is taking your infrastructure expertise and then applying it to AI infrastructure, AI models, and AI training. It's not a fundamentally new concept for you, and if you want to future-proof your career or stand out in the market, then taking advantage of this AI opportunity right now will put you in the best position for years to come. As always, I'm rooting for you I'll see you on the next one.